No. Hi, uh, IS. Can I call you IS? <laughs> or can I? Can I? Yeah. This one was me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. Thank you so much for joining me uh, for this little National Poetry Month uh, salon chit chat reading. <laughs> um, I have known you, you know, for so many years. We read at a reading together back when I think I was a fetus, and you know, I definitely felt like a nobody. Uh, and it was. I, I remember. I think you read after me and you came up on stage and the way you just like gripped that room, which wasn't very packed to begin with, but the way you gripped that room, I was just like, oh my God, that's, that's who I want to be. That's a kind of, that's a kind of reader I want to be of my work. And you know, we've, you, you know, you've read at a reading series I host, I've seen you around, I've seen your readings and you're always so, I guess you channel such and exude such a strength when you're on stage and you know your your work I absolutely love it so I'm very excited that you're joining me for this I'm gonna read your bio to the people who are watching Ice Jones is a queer American Nigerian poet and music journalist she is a graduate fellow with the watering hole and holds fellowships from Kalalu Boat Writers Retreat and Brooklyn Poets She's the 2018 winner of the Brittle Paper Award in Poetry. IS hosts a month-long workshop every April called The Singing Bullet. She is a book editor with Indolent Books, editor at 2035 Africa, an anthology of contemporary poetry, freelancers for Complex, Your Milk, NBC News Think, and elsewhere. Her works have appeared or are forthcoming in Guernica, Washington Square Review, The Rumpus, Brittle Paper, Hesperios, The Offing, The Shade Journal, Nat Brut, Puerto del Sol and elsewhere. She is the co-editor of the Young African Poets Anthology and is currently guest editing for uh, Lolvi. Her work was chosen by the 2020 Madison, uh, Madison, Wisconsin Poet Laureate as the winner of Bus Lines Poetry Contest. She is an MFA candidate in poetry at um, University of Wisconsin Madison as well as the 2019-20 Kemper K. Knapp University Fellowship recipient. She splits, oh no. She splits her time between Madison and New York. I imagine. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Cut. Okay, cut off that part over here. It's like I can. I can join the lines here. But thank you so much for doing this. And yeah, I'm gonna let you take it away. Yeah. So I have. Yeah. Like I was saying before, I'm not. I'm very bad at trying to write and teach at the same time. But I somehow have pushed myself to commit to morning pages turning off my phone and giving myself the morning to write something new. So I've written two new poems. One's like a radical edit of an old poem and then one's a new, one's a very, very new poem. Uh, I've been doing these self-portraits, so people can't pronounce my name. Um, and it seems to be an issue that happens sometimes either between Americans or Nigerians, they can't pronounce my name. So I've been doing this thing where I do self-portraits and I write self-portraits towards these several misspellings. Mm -hmm. is that the reason you go by is now also or no yes no and yes i mean i was going by is already and then and then it kept getting more and it just started as a joke the self-portrait like, all of you have made up such creative names for me and none of these names are mine so i made it i said it as a joke i'll do these self-portraits and then i realized okay this is actually something i stumbled upon right mm. there's a bit more there's more intersections of colorism and culture and me trying to find more connection to my Nigerian heritage in ways that I've been denied having been born a diasporan African, being born in America, but still also being Nigerian. Mm. Now, people often try to deny me my heritage because I'm, I'm an American, I have a blue passport, I have an American accent. Um, I have certain privileges that come with being an American that, um, are things that I have to reconcile with, you know what I mean? Privilege is strange that way. You have to kind of learn to reconcile with the fact that you have been given certain advantages over others. And privilege isn't inherently wrong, but I think what you choose to do or don't do with that privilege is where it becomes a bit more complicated, right? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Self-portrait as Etola. What would you like? I'd like my money's worth. Richard Sykin. I tell myself I'm above capitalism, but get angry when my package isn't delivered on time. I wait for my parcel like a woman hoping her dead husband would finally pull his body from the battlefield 
I miss him but hated his rough mouth, how he would curse me for not cooking the chicken right, called me a bitch because I creased a page in the book he was reading. History repeats itself. History drags itself out of the water. History drags its shadow over memory. Memory and history sit on opposite ends of my dinner table. I pour them both another cup of bold black tea. Memory pulls at its face and begins to unravel. Memory asks me, what of yours has gone missing? There's so much I miss. The chiaroscuro of light against his body hair. He told me he feared not satisfying me in bed. When you're thirsty enough, anything wet goes down like water. Even in my ascent towards love, he could never meet my sharpest eye. Buzzfeed tells me old lovers are apologizing for past transgressions. An ex-friend says I don't mean to sound like an ex-boyfriend, but I miss you and want you back. I want to be loved by someone who isn't intimidated by me, who doesn't punish me for their shortcomings. My best friend said God made me short so I can't grab grown men by the scruff of their neck. There are so many names I've been called, I said to memory, but none of them belong to me. Every day I look out my window like a woman who missed out on her life being everyone something else. Fuck boys on Twitter pray to their God future. I'm lonely, but at least I belong to myself. History drinks from its cup, asks me to say something true. I long for the days when men went to war and never returned. Mm. Thank you. I long for the days that men went to war and never returned. Oh, what a, what a, (laughs) (laughs) what a like, what a cutting line. What a cutting line. I mean, um, I, I, I can't, I can't think of a single line that sort of delivers, it it, is said so, I guess, gracefully, but is also implies so much uh, about it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I, you know, I love that idea of memory and history sitting on opposite ends of the table and um, which almost feels like memory and history are also disjointed things, right? In, in, in through the narrative of this poem. And I wonder what that means to you personally, uh, because I, you know, the idea of what, like what you remember may not be accurate in all its form, but also maybe disjoint. Like, how do you see memory and history as disjointed? So I think about memory, right, and also gaslighting, the ways in which I've been gaslighting my own family and how I know I know what I remember and I trust what I remember, right? Um, but I also think about how memory is often distorted by the, bru- by the brutality of history. Um, when I think about how my mother survived uh, the Nigerian Civil War as a child and how there are a lot of things from her life when she was younger that she still won't tell me and still hasn't told me. Um, I'm thinking about how cruel history is and also how cruel memory is. Maybe sometimes it's like two different cruelties, right? Um, you can make the argument that history is a collective memory of cruelty, but memory is mm-hmm. an individual cruelty. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking about how, you know, history and memory are all can often be at odds with each other because what you remember may not be what everyone else remembers. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that does. You know, I've I've always, like, as someone who's been in the community with you, I've always just looked at your portfolio and resume and thought, wow, this is, this is, this is good. This is, like, this is good work that's being done, you know, and every time I heard you read, I always heard you, I've heard you read, like, multiple times by now, at least, like, four times, and each time that it's been a different poem, it's, like, you are a busy poet, you are a busy writer, and you keep yourself, you're constantly out there your work is constantly out there so I was like shook when I found out you were going for your MFA and I'm like she doesn't have an MFA she's like she's done all this and she doesn't have an MFA um so my question to you is like after having like built this body of work and after having like developed these you know being recognized by these journals that we all respect and we all want to be a part of what was it that prompted you to get, because it's like the MFA or no MFA argument, right? What is it that prompted you to want to get an MFA? Yeah, so I want to kind of like backtrack a little bit. This is my second attempt at trying to get an MFA. I mm-hmm. was in an MFA program before. I won't mention the name of it because it's not. Yeah. Really, but I left that program because they were dishonest with me about how the funding was being distributed. 
Mm. They told me that only first years get funding and it's called recruitment money. And they actually use the word recruitment, which is really like frightening and startling to me. Um, so I left that program. I didn't, I made the choice to not turn in my, my thesis uh, state, my thesis defense. Mm. I, I graduated, so to speak. I, I participated in the ceremony and I left. I didn't formally turn in my final, my final paper and my final thesis. So I took a two year break from school. I lived in New York for a little bit and then I moved back to California with my family. And in between that time, I was writing a lot. I was writing every day. I was writing essays, poems. I was traveling. I was teaching. I taught at I taught at uh, Pink Doors Writers Retreat as a as a as an instructor, which was a really beautiful and amazing experience. Um, and I also kind of needed to see if I could craft a life around writing without the formal structure of an MFA program, because is this pervasive? idea that's really upsetting to me that if you don't have an MFA you're not a proper writer mm. or you're not a real writer and I find that really gross and elitist and kind of classes because most of these programs don't have space for all of us like all of us cannot be in an MFA program I mean yeah most of us cannot for financial reasons or other reasons getting into an MFA program is difficult as it is and that's further compounded by getting into a fully funded MFA program um but but our generation seems to want to uphold this idea that's completely wrong that if you're not if you don't have an MFA, you shouldn't be taken seriously as a writer. And I really want to push back against that because a lot of the poets that we love and admire, none of them had MFAs. Many of them didn't even have formal degrees in English, right? They were doing other things and they also happened to be writers too, right? But they, they read, they engaged in their craft, they were very diligent and kept up a strict writing regimen. And that informed the way in which they, they put work out into the world. Mm. I think if you want to be a writer, you should just write. And that's the end of it. I, will, I live for the day where we get away from this idea that, oh, if you, if you don't have an MFA, I can't take you seriously as a writer. Oh, if you didn't study with such and such, I can't take you seriously as a writer. Oh, if you weren't published at such and such, I can't you take you seriously as a writer. And I, I don't know, it's just, yeah, I just don't like how that is becoming a pervasive notion and I would like for some, I would like for it to be challenged. Mm -hmm. So I made the choice to apply to UW-Madison because I was ready to try again in a formal program. But there were specific writers at UW-Madison that I wanted to study with and I think that's very important, right? Mm -hmm. I was also very fortunate that it's a fully funded program who was also deeply invested in me as a writer and, and growing me as a writer. And when I applied for the program, I was very, I was very forthcoming about my experiences. I was in an MFA program before I left. These are the reasons why. If you accept me to this program, with all the experience that I've done before, I would bring that and then some to the program, right? And I was very serious about being honest with them about how I got to where I am now. Right. Yeah. So yeah, they said yes to me. It, it felt like a miracle too because UW-Madison was my first choice program. I had applied to an, a handful of schools, but I was really just like, please God, let me use this program. Mm -hmm. Let me do this program. This is my first choice. Um, and they said yes. And they awarded me the Kemper Fellowship, which allowed me to um, forego teaching until next year, until the second year of my MFA program. Nice. Which afforded me an incredible amount of time to write and finish my thesis project, which is near completion. Hmm. I'm extremely grateful for the time I get in the program as it is because the way the program is structured is that it's very hands-off. They give you the space and structure and, and financial stability to write, but they also trust that you will do that work on your own. Yeah. So that plus the fellowship, I had so much time on my hands to do all this work. Um, and that's really what I needed at the time. I, I know I could write. I was a writer before I was accepted to this program but I needed the financial stability and the space away from everything that was distracting me so I can finish what I started, which was this manuscript. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so, uh, you know, it's such a nice romantic story of all the people who like wrote in their closets and like wrote during lunch break and it's very nice, but like people don't have to do that if there is an option not to do it, you know? If you can figure out a way where somebody can pay you and you can just have to sit and write, take it. Like you don't have to have you know, you don't have to have to be doing something. And I, I, I would take another MFA in a heartbeat. I don't, even know. <laughs> I don't even know if that's valid, if that's something you can even, I mean, I can't do it on my visa, but like, you know, if there was an option, I would 
So, you know, I, one of the questions I always wanted to ask you, I guess, after a poetry reading, um, and this was sort of craft related, but also narrative related. Um, there's so many of your poems that make reference to, you know, Baba it, it is, you oh. know, returns in a lot of your work. And, you know, as, as a audience member, sometimes that feels like a stand in for father, but also God, like heavenly father. So oh. I feel like we're talking like multiple layers here. And um, I, find it so I guess easy to write about my mother with whom I have a very complicated relationship but not as it's trickier to write about my father and I just feel like you know where does that I guess you know where does that um, uh, how does that come into your work narratively and also how do you like look at it like what what are the levels at which you're working there yeah so the manuscript I'm working on reimagines Cain and Abel as sisters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, obviously in, in Europe, my first language and also, you know, the language I'm relearning now as an adult, um, when we talk about God, we often refer to him as Baba. Mm -hmm. But I also love how it translates into multiple different languages, you know? In Hebrew, you say Abba for father. And I love how there's a level of intimacy because God feels very formal. And I imagine in the Old Testament, when humans interacted with God, they called him something more intimate than God. And that for me was where that comes from. And I think maybe in also some kinds of ways, me referring to God as Baba is me also kind of reconciling with my relationship with my actual father. Mm. In, in the manuscript, I imagine my father split between Adam and God in some way. Mm. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, I was trying to push away from the idea, because God feels so formal and he's already such a big looming figure, both in a cultural setting, but also in the book too. And I wanted to kind of find a way to humanize God a little bit more, but also still kind of keeping this sort of mysterious, I guess, veil over his face, so to speak, mm. which is why it's nice to uh, refer to him as Baba throughout those, those series of poems. Yeah, where did this like, this... Uh, when did this become like a narrative direction to go? Like the idea of reimagining Cain and Abel as sisters. Like what is it about that particular story that prompted that gender reimagining, like gender role reversal? So my sister and I, we don't get along, <laughs> right? Um, but also I wanted to try to figure out, so when I wrote the first poem, she and I lived together. We lived together in Queens. And it was a nightmare living with each other because we were like always trying to kill each other at every step of the way. It was just, it was just, it just felt like a biblical fight all the fucking time. It just never mm. ended. And I wrote the first poem, one of the first poems that opens up the manuscript because I was just so angry all the time and I was so blinded with rage. And I just for a minute felt like I could understand, I could understand Cain's just, just blinding rage to just end their own sibling because I couldn't fucking take it anymore. Mm. And that's where that poem began. And I thought it was just going to be a one-time thing. I get this off my chest and then it was done. But I kept finding myself constantly coming back to the, to the fable, right? I grew up on um, this childhood storyteller. He recently passed named Tommy DePaola. And he wrote the book of Bible stories for children. And there's this very distinct time, there's this very distinct part in the book where he references Cain and Abel. And there's a picture of Cain with like a rock in his hand and he bashes his brother's skull in. And I had never seen like blood in a childhood storybook before. So I thought that was really crazy. Mm. I, I, that story never left me, even though like 20 years had passed and I had forgotten about it. But it was my first, it was really my first time seeing the siblings outside of the Bible. And I don't know, I just kind of always, I felt, I always felt drawn to Cain because I could understand loving someone so much, loving someone that you would defend them at all costs but also ending them because you're so angry with them right and i and that's what makes the story their story both heartbreaking and also so so i guess intimate for me mm. like in that sort of complexity that intersection between love and violence what it means to be someone's protector but also be the, the thing that destroys them and yeah that's how it began for me well i love that i you know i think about uh I, lo I love that especially because I think as um, I, I think as a skeptic and as someone who's not you know um, who's almost anti-religious at this point but like I always I'm always looking for mythology in real life mm -hmm. some kind of tale that feels epic that 
one can latch on to. So I just like, I really understand where you're coming from, but you know, thank you so much for doing this with me. This was, it's so lovely to have you. Thank you, Timothy, for joining us. Uh, I am going to stop recording now. This was great. <laughs> thank you.